And welcome back to You Rejoin at 120. I'm Jeff Cliff, and this is a series of 120 videos of things that I learned as a student at the University of, Reg of Regina. And today we're going to be talking about the gambler's fallacy, probably one of the more important logical fallacies, and the easiest one, or one of the easier ones to commit. This fallacy is so powerful, so potent, so uh, liable to catch people in its snares, that it has literally built a city in the desert with giant water fountains. That city is, of course, Las Vegas, and that city is built because of gambling and the millions of people that have come to that city and given them their money when they could have easily avoided that situation had they understood the gambler's fallacy and the problems associated with it. So how is this going to look? How is this fallacy going to happen? So let's say, I wonder if I got a coin here as an example. Very quickly, pulling out a coin. Looks like I do, I can sound, I, I can hear it. So here's a fair like coin, you kind of see on the video here. It's a Canadian quarter, made in, uh, oh, I don't know, this year. So we can flip it, and we get tails. Now, if I were to repeat this a couple of times, tails, that was in fact tails. So perfect example. So we have, now, of course, am I cherry picking this video or not? We'll see. But uh, we have three tails. And I could keep flipping, but three is enough for this video. Uh, and th the question is um, given that this coin is a fair coin, and we've now flipped it three times, we've got tails three times, uh, wouldn't you think that if I flip it again, it's probably going to be heads? Of course, if you were to think that, you would be committing the gambler's fallacy. Because in fact, no matter how many times you flip this coin, it doesn't matter what the previous results of that flip were to ask what the next result is going to be. It's going to always be heads or tails, and it's not going to matter what the previous flips were. Uh, so you have a 50% chance of heads a 50% chance of tails. In this case, it just so happens that the next one was heads. But if we were to have bet on that, there was a 50% chance that we were going to lose. And it may seem sometimes as though it's not a 50% chance. If you have nine tails in a row, it may seem like the odds of getting another head are some, somehow lower, that you should somehow bet that heads are going to come up. But if you were to do that, there's, a, again, a 50% chance that you would lose your money. This is the essence of the gambler's fallacy. This kind of suspension of belief, this, this, this uh, allowance for things that we know to be random to suddenly, in our minds, seem less random and seem as though there is a, a divine, perhaps, reason why they should come to be uh, or give us results that are more predictable. So, we, we may talk a little bit about, in the future, of determining whether this coin is in fact fair. And uh, when we talk about Bayes, we'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, but the co if you have a fair coin, and most, the vast, vast majority of coins in circulation, uh, in Canada at least, are probably pretty damn close to fair. Uh, at least close enough for that if you flip a coin, you're going to get a fair like result. And so you, you get this situation where you, you, you flip these, these, these nine tails, you know, do you bet on it after that, even though it looks as though another head should come? Of course, you, you can probably infer this behavior, this, this property of randomness, if you have a deep understanding of what random variables actually are and how they work. But we haven't got to that in this point in the series, and so you don't necessarily know that. Uh, but in general, if it's random, you can't predict it. You might be able to predict things about it, you might be able to predict longer term trends, but you can't predict the result in the short term. Statistics and science will tell us about the patterns that we are likely to and not to find 
in long runs, or even short runs, of coin flips and other random uh, chance events. And so if we are worried about determining whether or not the gambler's fallacy is being committed, uh, that is where we should be spending our time, is actually looking at the statistics and reasoning based on the laws of probability, which again, we haven't gotten into yet. Uh, but if we're not going to do that, uh, then we risk committing this fallacy. So, in general, if you're reasoning that because of some frequency or some event in the past, that the, the future uh, frequency of some event uh, will, will change, or, or that you're more likely to encounter uh, or less likely to encounter something in the future, you risk committing this fallacy. On the same level, if you are if you believe you have a random process or a random event that is happening multiple times, then if you believe that it's becoming less random with time, again, you risk committing this fallacy. Uh, if you believe that in the short term, deviations from longer term trends will be corrected, again, you will be committing this fallacy. In the long term, it is very likely that there will be just as many heads as tails if you flip coins enough, even if you start with nine tails. But in the short term, there's nothing keeping that from happening. On the flip side, you could also probably derive this from uh, the idea of, an in of a dependent variable or a non-random variable as well. Uh, but again, we're not going to go into that too deep. Uh, but this, this problem right here is one of the reasons that statistics is hard. It is a, a science that people have worked on for hundreds of years and we still screw it up from time to time. As with other fallacies, this is related to other logical fallacies that we've already done videos of. Uh, the first one is the is ought uh, fallacy, or the is video, uh, where we are assuming that the next one ought to be H, when in fact, there is no uh, decision to go from is, you know, nine tails to ought uh, heads. It's related to the uh, uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc video, uh, in that we are, again, concluding that something just because it is follows uh, something else, that it can be caused by that something else. It's related to the Texas sharpshooter fallacy, uh, because we can come up with these kind of uh, seemingly uh, rare patterns in data if we only take the time to flip the coin enough times. In this particular case, it, this is going to happen about one in every 500 sets of nine flips. So you flip this coin nine times, 512 times, 4,500, 4, something like that. Uh, something around 4,600 times, you'll probably get a run of nine tails. And worse than that, uh, our memory betrays us. So when we're flipping a coin that many times, it's entirely likely that we will misremember how many flips we've actually gotten in a row. So that makes it even worse for concluding that the next one will be heads, even if, if there were uh, something like this actually happening. So sometimes we want something to be true, and so we believe it. And that this is actually a mistake to do, uh, especially when our emotions are running high. And again, look to the argument from emotion video for more about emotions. But we, we really want to believe that the next one is going to be heads against our better judgment of the of knowing about how probability itself works. And especially when combined with the gambler's fallacy, where it seems like things should go our way next, and that it, 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 it's due time that we, we, we the next thing that will happen will be in our favor. But again, if the process is randomly determined, it may be in your favor, and it may not be. And you can know the odds of either happening 
for many things. And so we can kind of try to, to, to imagine things where uh, otherwise, but again, we, we know how this process works. We know that the, this coin is fair. Uh, so we should not believe, based on nine tails, that the next one will be heads. Uh, another example of where this will come into effect is people who think that uh, because of a certain amount of people in their family or their village or community or whatever are, are having sons, mm -hmm. that they will be, th it's their turn to have a daughter. Uh, and while there may be epigenetic factors involved, most of the time the decision of having a son or a daughter is a random process. It's roughly 50-50. There, again, may be some choice even involved, uh, but there's strong evolutionary pressure keeping it independent of previous events. Even if we'd like to believe that we can, you know, have someone or have a son or have a daughter uh, and choose that uh, based on past events, uh, it would be committing this fallacy to believe so. As mentioned in the Proctor Hawk or the uh, uh, post hoc or the Proctor Hawk video. Uh, dopamine makes this fallacy hard to see when you use enough dopamine. And so if you suspect that your dopamine system is malfunctioning, you may have problems with this. And so go see a doctor if you suspect that that's happening. So other examples where this can come up. Uh, the biggest one, as mentioned, are casinos and gambling. Uh, of course, there are a lot of things that are gambling in life, but unfortunately there are these buildings dedicated to uh, encouraging people to de to actually gamble, uh, and so you can go to see uh, in the OLC casino across the street here. Uh, look at the machines, take tallies of what, uh, how often they pay out versus how much money goes into them. Uh, you'll probably get thrown out by security if you try, but even so, uh, you'll find out fairly quickly that there's only a you know less than a hundred percent chance or payout rate relative to a large amount of money being put in. Um, and nevertheless, you'll see people who are sitting there who are putting money into this system and not enjoying themselves. You know, it, it, it's one thing to enjoy gambling uh, and to enjoy giving money to someone else. I mean, there's the flashy lights and, it's, you know, it spins your dopamine system up a little bit. That's fine. But a lot of the people who go to casinos, especially older people with dopamine problems, don't necessarily enjoy it. They just go because it's routine and habit for them. And they have a lot of money lifted from them, which is very unfortunate to watch. In addition to casinos, there's also the whole science of geology. If you go back to what geology is, and it, the very basics of it, uh, you can get to the point where pretty much everything that humanity knows about the long-term geological foundations uh, are derived from, or were at least initially derived from, uh, the, the appearance of uh, events in the past justifying what we would predict in the future uh, in a way that completely disregards this. It's unfortunate, and it may even be the best we can do, but it's worth thinking about at least. Kind of another example uh, is apparently on August 18, 1913, there was a record 26 times that black came up on a roulette table. And so let's see how a roulette table works. So you have a wheel, a little ball that's put into the wheel, and at the after the wheel spins for a while, the ball ends somewhere on the circumference of the wheel. And roughly half of the wheel is red, roughly half of the wheel is black. There's a small subset where the house wins, where it is neither red nor black, uh, but we can ignore it for the, this purpose. Um, and so this is going to be a random process, assigning uh, a point on this circumference uh, to this ball for every spin of the wheel, and it's either going to be red or black. And in this case, uh, the uh, black came up 26 times. So you have 26 times that the wheel would spin, the black area of the wheel uh, gets the ball. And then the question was, for the people who are watching this, is which side do you bet on? Uh, and some people are going to bet on black because it's you know, 
looks like it's, it's on a run or something like that. And some people are going to bet on red because it looks like it's time for the run to end, maybe. Um, but it doesn't matter because the way this is set up, the past point along the wheel doesn't determine, or doesn't determine the next one. And so eventually this, this chain of 26 runs breaks and people who bet on red win, people who bet on black lose, and then the, the other people uh, eventually will lose in, in the end as the uh, house takes their cut. So what are some counterexamples of this, where it's valid to use uh, and to assume that processes become less random as you use them? Uh, well, sometimes even casinos are not fair, and that they will even use psychology and results from psychology to make you win enough so that you start believing that you can win and that the house won't necessarily always win in the casino. And so they'll feed you some wins after you've lost a couple of times. More wins than statistics would say that you should be winning, so that your brain learns to associate the act of gambling with positive outcomes. Then, of course, they take advantage of you and take all your money. But uh, it's important to note that this can happen. If someone is in control of the game, uh, and in fact some video games have a random number generator that explicitly encodes this logic in, that they can actually make the gambler's fallacy false for the purpose of the game. But that's only inside the game. Outside the game, and in the rest of the universe, this fallacy applies. And if you gamble with your money, uh, you will lose it. The house always wins. So, uh, unfortunately, a lot of empirical work uh, involves the use of random variables. And so you have to be very skeptical of your results when you interpret the results of that uh, and are not extremely careful with your statistics um, in order to kind of balance out the effect of this having happened to you. So in general, learn more statistics. You'll be better off uh, if you do so, and don't commit this particular fallacy quite so often. Um, but uh, again, millions of people do this. Millions, or many people lose their money. Don't be one of them. Don't gamble unless you know you're going, you have the edge. Be the house, not the person giving your money to the house. If you have any questions or would like to relay some tale of your incredible luck, uh, feel free to leave them anywhere where this video is posted. Uh, as usual, uh, this is video is for you, the listener, and uh, we we will take a Bitcoin donation so that you can watch the uh, you can have put the responsibility of watching the market uh, and to see where it goes on my shoulders instead of yours. Uh, and uh, as usual, we will be back for a, another video next time. Hope to see you then.